this week. We're reading from the ninth chapter, verses 30 through 37. Listen to the word of God. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. He did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, the Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask him. Then they came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, What were you arguing about on the way? But they were silent, for on the way they had argued with one another about who was the greatest. He sat down, called the twelve, and said to them, Whoever wants to be first must be last of all and a servant of all. Then he took a little child and put it among them, and taking it in his arms, he said to them, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Now please be seated. Bow with me, please. May the words of our words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. This gospel pericope says that Jesus and the disciples were traveling through Galilee, and Jesus was teaching his disciples about how the Son of Man, he, the Son of Man, would be taken uh, by the hands of men and be killed, and then he would rise again on the third day. And his disciples didn't understand. And if you remember last week's sermon, we talked about who is Messiah. And I think they had a little different idea about Messiah than we do today. And they were so confused, they were afraid to ask him anything. But instead of that, they argued. And when they arrived in Capernaum, Jesus asked them, saying, what were you guys arguing about on the road as we were walking here? The disciples were silent. Because on the way, they had argued about who's the greatest, who's the most important. Now folks, that's got to be a silly argument. And one I know none of us have ever had with anybody else in our entire lives. I mean, how do you decide what is important and who is important? What kind of measuring stick do you use for that? How do you debate the, the question, what's the question? So, so let's think about this for just a minute. Who is the greatest? Who is the most important? Is it the farmer? Here it is the farmer who brings us milk and produce and food so that we may eat and be healthy and be nourished. But we also think about the teacher. Our teachers are important. They may be the greatest because they teach people uh, about the various skills that they need to be successful in life. How about doctors? We know doctors are important because they keep us from getting fatal diseases. How about lawyers or judges? They work hard for justice. How about them or, or our military? Because our military keeps us safe. How about janitors and garbage men? 
If we didn't have janitors and garbage men, think of all the stuff we throw away every week, and if it just kept piling up, we would choke on all our own waste products. This is an endless argument once you get into it. And boy, the disciples did well to remain silent when Jesus asked them about it. But I have to ask, why do we have this quest to determine Who's the most important? This quest to be number one. I mean, why are we bothering with this question? Why do we bother with who's the greatest? And I have to tell you, as I was writing this sermon, I kept thinking of Muhammad Ali. I'm the greatest. I'm the greatest. And he was for that. But it really doesn't have much to do with this, does it? You know, we want to be better. We want to be more powerful. We want to have something better that can lord it over our brothers and sisters, and we feel good about it. It's an essential thing for our lives sometimes. But I say today there's a different way of life. There's a different way of looking at who we are and how we're in the world, and I believe it's a more helpful way, a way that just avoids that question of who is the greatest. It avoids who should be first, and it looks at the quality of life. Now, after Jesus asked the disciples what it was they were arguing about, Jesus calls them all together, and he brings a child into their midst. And he says, if anyone wants to be first, he must be the very last, the servant of all. And then he set that little child on his lap, and he said, whoever welcomes one of these little children welcomes me. And whomever welcomes me does not welcome me, but the one who sent me. Jesus speaking of another way of being in the world, another way of living. Frederick Buechner says, who is the greatest in the kingdom of God? The disciples asked this because they were trying hard. They were listing all the things that they were doing to be good disciples. But Beekner says that probably that child had no concept of what Jesus was talking about with his disciples, nor did the kid care. And Jesus told us we should be like that little child, neither knowing nor caring nor being anxious about that question, who is the greatest? in the kingdom of God. And folks, I think there's a difference between being childish and being childlike. You know, we think about a baby, a human infant, and that baby, when it's born, lies in bed all day. It can barely move its arms and its legs and its eyes do not yet focus. And that baby has no awareness of what's going on around it. 
and that baby has no expectation that things are going to get any better. We've all been there. We've all outgrown that condition, but we all needed to be there at one time. And so it is with our faith. Instead of stomping around and screaming, it's not fair, we mellow. And we realize the wisdom of folks, life's not fair. When we do good deeds and we keep a running total of how good we are. Look at me, I've done four good deeds today. <coughs> Excuse me. <clears throat> That's about us. It's not about God. And when we approach God, approach our lives with the expectation of what God should do for us, and we pray that God will help us fulfill that should, that's a childish faith. Hopefully, as we grow, we begin to understand that faith is not performance-based. Faith is grace-based. When we have a childlike faith, the wisdom faith, we accept God's will for our lives. We accept those situations that we face each day and we understand most of the things that happen around us are simply out of our control. <clears throat> to have that childlike relationship with God we just simply plunge into it knowing that we trust where God will take us. And we begin with that trust and from there a mature faith can develop. We start every day asking God's will. We don't start with what I need. <clears throat> Jesus is saying that the kingdom of God is, is not about who's the greatest, who's first, but that we see other people, all other people, as beloved children of God, as each of us, all of us, our beloved children of God. There's a poem, it's an old poem, you've heard it before, but I think it's very apropos for today, and it goes like this. <clears throat> when I say I'm a Christian, I am not shouting, I am saved, I'm whispering, I was lost, and that's why I choose this way. When I say I'm a Christian, I don't speak it with pride. I confess that I stumble and need someone to be my guide. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not trying to be strong. I'm professing that I am weak and pray for the strength to carry on. When I say I'm a Christian, I'm not bragging of success. I'm admitting I have failed and cannot ever pay the debt. When I say I'm a Christian, I am not claiming to be perfect. <laughs> My flaws are too visible, but God believes I'm worth it. When I say I'm a Christian, I still feel the sting of pain. I have my share of heartaches, which is why I speak his name. 
When I say I'm a Christian, I do not wish to judge. I have no authority. I only know I'm loved. Jesus came among us, not as a Lord, not as a boss, not as an important person. He came among us as a servant. He came to touch, to embrace, to heal, to forgive, to help, to love. And he knew that this would get him killed on the cross. I think our prayer should not be make me someone important or give me wealth and success, but perhaps we should ask our Savior for a mature, wisdom-filled, childlike faith that we might trust each and every day, each and every minute that God's way is best, regardless. That childlike state represents our best way of relating to God, because we are indeed fallen creatures. We are seeking contact with our perfect creator, May the Lord bless us and keep us and shine his face on us and be gracious to us and give us his peace. Amen and amen.